Okay, hello everybody. Today I'm going to be talking about two complementary approaches that we, uh, that we use at the Greener Genetics Center to identify the etiology of autism. Autism belongs to uh, a group of neuro neurodevelopmental disorders along with Asperger's syndrome and pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified uh, that fall under the umbrella of autism spectrum disorders. And these uh, uh, disorders are characterized by limitations in social interaction, limited or absent communication, and repetitive or atypical behaviors. Um, ASDs are lifelong disabilities um, with a lifetime um, cost of raising a child with ASD in the U.S. estimated at between 1.4 and 2.4 million dollars. Current CDC numbers um, show that ASDs affect one in 68 children, or around 1% of the general population, and they affect predominantly males with a male to female ratio of five to one. And ASDs are heterogeneous, have a heterogeneous uh, genetic etiology with 5% of patients having a cytogenetically visible abnormality, 10 to 20% having a copy number variance, and 5% having a monogenic um, disorder. And in addition, 11 to 37% of ASD patients have coexisting genetic disorders, such as Fragile X, Rett syndrome, and Angelman syndrome. Now, the Green Genetic Center has had a longstanding interest in uh, autism and has spearheaded many efforts to uh, identify the etiology of the disorder. And in 1995, the GGC um, I, um, initiated uh, the South Carolina Autism Project, and within a three-year span, um, we collected samples from 209 patients, and these patients underwent extensive clinical evaluations as well as um, laboratory testing. And through this testing, we found abnormal findings in roughly 20% of the patients, which means that 80% um, had, had an, or still have a, sorry, 80% have an unidentified etiology. Um, to uh, identify the etiology in at least some of these uh, remaining patients, we undertook uh, two complementary approaches. And the first one was a targeted next generation sequencing panel. So currently we're working with the second edition of this panel. The original one contains 62 genes and it was uh, designed in collaboration with uh, Emory Genetics Lab. And the 92 gene panel um, has obviously 30 extra genes. And all these genes were chosen because they either harbor mutations associated with uh, ASD. Uh, uh, they have genes, uh, sorry, the genes uh, are associated with syndromic autism, or uh, the genes are chosen because uh, um, th they were chosen, they've been shown through association studies to be linked to, aut to autism. These 92 genes span almost 1,800 exons, or 335,000 bases. Here's a list of the 92 genes. And given the context of uh, this panel, um, we can use a, a subset of these genes to, as a second tier test to screen patients uh, that have phenotypes uh, resembling Rett and Angelman syndrome. So we validated this 92 gene panel with eight positive controls that contained variants identified through Sanger sequencing and we obtained 100% concordance, as you can see. Uh, further evaluation of this panel showed that we obtained high coverage of the targeted regions, and almost 99% of the sequence covered was covered at 100x. Um, the average exon span coverage was 99.3%, and the average number of dropouts was six exons out of the almost 1,800. Now to the patient data. Um, to date, we have evaluated, or we have ran uh, 374 samples on this panel, and this includes not only the 92 gene panel, but as well as the 62 gene panel. And uh, obviously, you'll notice this number is higher than the 209 that I initially showed you from in this gap. So it only doesn't include only the SCAP patients, but as well um, patients that have been referred for other diagnostic testing. And of these 374 patients, we have completed 318 and 56 are still awaiting confirmation. 
We found an average number of variance of 0.77 per patient and uh, with a range of zero to nine variance per patient. And out of these 374, we have found 24 that have pathogenic variants. So I'm gonna go through a couple of examples. One of the pathogenic variants was found in the beta catenin gene. This was a heterozygous uh, nonsense mutation. And uh, we obtained high coverage of this region and 41% of the reads uh, uh, were uh, represented the mutant allele. We confirmed this change with Sanger sequencing and uh, patients that have deletions or mutations in the beta catenin gene typically present with severe intellectual disability, with absence or very limited speech, microcephaly, microcephaly and spasticity. Another pathogenic variant was found in the Dirk one a gene, which is a dual specificity tyrosine phosphorylation regulated kinase 1A. Uh, this was a heterozygous insertion of a G, or one base pair insertion, and it was found to be de novo through parental testing. Again, we obtained high coverage, and um, the mutant allele was, again, represented around 40% of the reads. And patients with mutations in Dirk 1A uh, typically presented with microcephaly, uh, seizures, autism, uh, limited or absent speech, and facial dysmorphologies such as deep set eyes, uh, large protruding ears, smooth philtrum, and thin upper lip. So there are several advantages to the NGS panel. Uh, for one, we obtain high coverage of the targeted regions, and it's more cost effective uh, than Sanger sequencing each of the individual genes, and it provides better analysis of targeted genes compared to exome sequencing. However, one of the limitations of the panel is that it does not detect or it will not detect large deletions or duplications, at least with the current bioinformatic pipeline and data analysis that we use at the Greeno Genetic Center. So to circumvent this um, issue, we, we um, complemented the NGS panel with uh, microarray, and although there are several microarrays uh, that are commercially available, such as the whole genome SNP array, which have advantages such as uh, coverage of all the genes in the genome and very good coverage of the backbone of the genome for accurate breakbone uh, detection. They do have limitations such as not all the coding regions have probe coverage and, uh, deletions or and because of this deletions and duplications may be missed in one or more exons. So we decided because of these limitations to design our own um, custom array with the help of Agilent. So our custom array is a 4 by 108K SurePrint array. It contains 60,000 SNP probes and 120,000 copy number probes. Um, it covers 725 genes and 97% of the coverage of all exons with an average of three probes per exon. And the remaining 3% um, of exons that can have great coverage because of GC content or repetitive sequence um, we uh, designed uh, probes in the flanking introns. So to, val to validate this array, uh, we first used 16 samples that contain CNVs previously identified through whole genome SNP array, and we found 100% concordance, and we also used three samples that had deletions or duplications previously identified by multiplex ligation dependent probe amplification, and again, we obtained 100% concordance. To date, we have run 110 out of the 307 um, autism samples on the array. We have found 30 alterations, and four of these alterations were deletions within genes uh, that are on the NGS panel. Um, and we also found five uh, other alterations that are likely pathogenic within genes that are not part of the, that are not part of the 92 genes on the next-gen sequ sequencing panel. So one of the uh, alterations that we found was in the tuberous sclerosis 2 gene. Uh, it was a 17.4 uh, kilobase deletion spanning exons 1 through 16, as you can see up here. And uh, we confirmed this deletion using quantitative uh, PCR. And t uh, patients with deletions or mutations within this gene typically present with uh, benign tumors, such as the angiofibromas, as you can see on this patient's. Uh, face, uh, intellectual disability, seizures, and autism. 
Another pathogenic change was in the proto-cadherin gene, proto-cadherin 19. This was a 51.2 kilobase deletion spanning exons 5 and 6. And patients with uh, deletions and mutations in this gene typically present with seizures, intellectual disability, developmental delay, and autism. And again, we confirmed this change using quantitative PCR. And then one last example is, was a, a deletion in the, or in the AT rich interactive domain 1B. This was a 1.9 KB deletion spanning exon 1 of the gene. And patients with mutations or deletions in this gene typically present with developmental delay, abnormality of the fifth finger or toe, such as clinodactyly, and coarse facial features such as a broad nose, wide mouth, and as well as autism. And again, we confirm this using quantitative PCR. So there are many benefits uh, to our custom array. Uh, one of them is that it complements our, not only our autism panel, but it also complements the other panels that are offered at the Greeno Genetic Center. And another benefit is that it's very useful for screening for deletions or, or duplications in genes associated with autosomal disorders, uh, autosomal, sorry, autosomal dominant disorders, where no mutation has been found by sequencing, autosomal recessive disorders, where no or one mutation has been found by sequencing, and X-linked disorders in females where no or one mutation um, have been found by sequencing. So in summary, both the NGS panel and the custom array provide excellent coverage of the targeted regions that we are interested in, and it's very customizable, and genes can be readily updated um, on the panel and on the array. And when used in conjunction, the next generation sequencing panel and the custom array provide a more comprehensive analysis, thus providing uh, the genetic etiology for a subset of autism patients, which will end their diagnostic odyssey, hopefully improve their management, and offset some of the costs associated with raising a child with autism. So I'd like to thank everybody involved in this project at the Greenwood Genetic Center and especially the patients and the parents, and as well as Serge for giving me a chance to uh, present. Thank you. Thank you for this great talk. Uh, the floor is open for questions. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, were there any patients in your cohort which were really very syndromal? So besides the autism, which was the major finding, maybe other congenital anomalies, like a real syndromal presentation, or for example, the tuberous sclerosis patient, besides the hints on the face, mm -hmm. was it a clear TS patient or your cohort is like the major feature is autism. There are no clinical hints for a certain uh, syndrome in your patient population you screen. Oh, several patients had syndromal autism um, in our cohort, definitely. Um, so like I mentioned, the Red Angelman um, panel that we use, so a lot of them were referred for Red Angelman testing, and we happened to find a, a mutation that could also explain not only that, but as well as the, the autism. So then if I change my question to how many of your patients were totally non-syndromal autism case, cases, like one third or um, more than a That's a good question. Um, I, don't, I don't know those numbers off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, but was the know. majority syndromal or the majority non-syndromal? I would, I would say that I think the majority would be syndromal. So most of the patients that we get 
for diagnostic testing from outside of the genetic center, we don't get uh, much clinical information. It usually just says autism. But if we do find a mutation, often we'll go back to the clinician and they'll say, oh, yes, they, that goes with that syndrome. Um, for the ones that from, with, from the South Carolina Autism Project, I would say probably greater than 90% of those did not have other um, fe oh. features other than maybe macrocephaly. That was a, that, you know, a, a subset of patients did have macrocephaly, but other than that, there were not many that had other clinical features. Okay. One more question. Can I, can I just add to your question? The, the tuberous sclerosis patient is actually Dr. Mike Lyons, and he knew that, so that was like a slam dunk when we saw the TSC2 deletion. So he's sitting here, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That, that patient had a known diagnosis of tuberous sclerosis. And one of the advantages, I'm a clinician at the Greenwood Genetic Center, so I can talk to our lab and um, kind of come up with a plan because the family wanted to confirm the diagnosis and, and know for other family members. And so um, talking with our lab, we can figure out the best way of approaching that because we couldn't get the testing done through an outside lab for various reasons. And so our lab was able to, to do that and focus on those genes and actually did the autism panel and didn't find a mutation and then did the custom array and was able to confirm what we had already suspected. More questions? If no, then I would like to thank uh, all the wonderful speakers for this early morning session.